Well, the time is seven o'clock at the top of the hour, so we will call to order the City of South Lyon Joint Meeting of City Council and Planning Commission here on March 1st, 2021. Um, thank you, Paul, for that. Uh, let's all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and then we'll move on to roll call. <laughs> Allegiance flag. to the flag United of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Justice for all. Uh, let me first start by thanking all of you for being here this evening. I know we all have a lot on our schedules here. Um, the way we're going to kind of do this, uh, and, and Ms. McIntyre, you step in at any time if, if you'd like to help assist me, um, we're going to try and go through this a lot like we would the council meetings. Um, if you have a question or a concern at any time, once I've handed the floor over to Ms. McIntyre, if you could just raise your hand, um, it always helps to keep it in the camera shot. Um, <laughs> give, me, give me a little help, and then I'll be sure to recognize you, and we'll go about it that way. Um, at this point in time, uh, we will take a roll call like we normally would for city council meetings. Um, the city attorney is not here, but just so we're safe, if all of you would please um, state the city uh, or your location uh, that you are participating in this meeting um, as we go through here. So um, <clears throat> I'll start with council and then I'll move over to the planning commission. Um, council member Kibble. Here in South Lyon. Council Member Dill. Here in South Lyon. Council Member Kennedy. Here, City of South Lyon. Okay. Uh, Council Member Richards. Here, City of South Lyon. Great. Um, Dan Pelchat, I am also here in the City of South Lyon. Um, I did hear from Council Member Walton that she will not be able to join us this evening, and um, we'll just hope that Council Member Kurtzwell joins us here later. Um, Judy, if you wouldn't mind making a note of that if, if and when she does join us. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, on to our friends from the Planning Commission, Mr. Mosier. Here, South Lyon. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chubb. Here, from South Lyon. Mr. Lanham. Here, South Lyon. Let's see, is that everybody? Did I, if, if, no. if I missed anyone, please, please speak up. Tyler, are you still there? I don't see him. Tyler was there, but I don't see him now. So okay. I don't know. I did see him as well. And I, I don't know what, if you want to just put a timestamp next to him, if he ends up joining us again, that would be fine, I'm sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> All right, forgive me here, um, multitasking. Um, at this point in time, on number four, we'll look for the approval of this evening's agenda. Council Member Kennedy, go ahead. I'll move the agenda. Support. Support. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion passes. <clears throat> At this time, we'll open the floor for public comment. Um, please remember to state your name and address if you want to raise your hand virtually or physically. And uh, Judy, if, if you see anyone out there that's here for public comment, feel free to let us know. I don't see anyone. Okay. Um, you want to get Mr. Finnegan's roll call? Oh, yes, I didn't, I didn't see that. Okay. 
Um, Sorry, I lost connection. That's no problem. Uh, just um, if you could obviously just say present, uh, Mr. Finnegan, and where you are located for tonight's uh, meeting. Present, South Lyon, Michigan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Kibble. Certainly. <clears throat> Okay, with that, if we haven't seen anyone pop in for public comment, Jude? No, nope, I don't see anyone. We will close our public comment, move on to new business this evening. The presentation of draft zoning ordinance updates. At this point in time, I'm going to hand the floor over to Ms. McIntyre. If anyone has any questions or concerns, if you please, again, would just raise your hand, and I will help uh, navigate that as Ms. McIntyre does the presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, Mayor Pelchat. Um, I just wanna let you know, I'm having a little bit of an unstable connection. So if anyone has problems hearing me, let me know. I might have to move to a different location in the house to get um, better connection. But thank you all for being here this evening. Um, like um, the mayor said, I know we all have busy schedules and I um, appreciate you taking your time to have um, an extra night meeting um, here. Um, the Planning Commission is here, uh, several members, um, as we saw in roll call, they are here. Um, this is really their document. Um, we've been working on this zoning ordinance um, for a number of years. In fact, it goes back to when um, Maggie was on the Planning Commission. She was um, uh, part of the um, Planning Commission that actually wrote and drafted this. Um, it has um, gone through a couple attorney reviews, um, um, some Planning Commission meetings. Um, we have worked a long time on this document. Uh, and so we're pleased to be able to present this to you this evening. Um, after we do our presentation, I will um, ask for questions. Um, and then hopefully by the end of this meeting, um, I will have direction as to whether I need to make any additional edits or changes. And then following that, our next step is to have a public hearing at the Planning Commission meeting and then to the City Council. And then we can actually get this adopted on the books and we can be using this. Um, there are a lot of valuable um, process procedures and things that are in this ordinance that we don't currently have in our zoning ordinance. And so um, it was, it's imperative that we really um, get this moving. I know that you have my PowerPoint slides provided to you in advance, um, but Paul wanted me to do a quick, um, quickly go over this just to start the meeting. Um, is see if I can share my screen. Do I have pos option to share my screen? You should. Might be at the bottom. You see down at the bottom there. There you. Go. Are you? Do we see it now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, from the beginning, here we go. Okay, very good, okay. Okay, so why are we updating this ordinance? Well, one, this is a pretty old ordinance. The last time it was updated was 1995. Um, and um, that was just an update, it wasn't an overhaul. I feel like this is really an overhaul, the ordinance we are really um, reorganizing, updating. Um, so this is a pretty um, massive endeavor that the Planning Commission has taken on. Our current ordinance really lacks um, clarity and guidance. Um, you know, you have to go to different sections for things like, for example, site plan review standards are in two different sections of the ordinance. That can be confusing. Um, it's difficult for users that are trying to develop in our community, and then it's also difficult for staff to administer. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we included um, new land uses and development trends that are um, happening, and, is, and also um, some new streamlined um, development procedures. Uh, finally, um, as part of the zoning ordinance, the map is, um, is a, par a portion of the zoning ordinance, and we have a few things that we need to update on our zoning ordinance map. I believe the last one was in 2014, so we have some rezonings that we would like to get on there. We'd also like to update it so that the knolls is properly shown, um, and then also I have um, some suggestions or we would like to look at expanding um, the central business district. As well, all the reasons. Um, like I said, our old ordinance was hard to navigate. It only had seven articles, and within that, it was broken down. What we've done is we have, you know, you look at the number 25 that looks, yes, it's expanded, but it's very 25 succinct um, articles that we believe are easy to use, navigate. There'll be a table of contents in the front. Um, so any developer, um, you know, a, a, a seasoned developer or someone, um, you know, just starting out for the first time, we think that they'll be able to use this ordinance. Um, quite easily, it'd be user-friendly. Um, this is how we have reorganized things. Um, so basically we have a general section, 
you've got five different things. The general section, which gives the authority uh, for the zoning ordinance and then the general provisions. The next um, section we have are all the districts, residential, office, commercial, industrial. Then we move into the approval procedures, um, conditional land use, plan unit development, those are a few. And then the development review standards. Those are the things that we um, look at when we're evaluating um, a development, such as the parking and the access management. And then finally, the administration. Um, it gives us um, the um, authority to review these. It includes the ZBA and then a large um, section for definitions, which um, are crucial when you're, um, crucial really, when you're trying to um, read the ordinance. So the first most important thing is article one is that we need to identify that the zoning ordinance is enabled um, and has the authority from the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act, which is PA Act 110 of 2006. Previously did not have that, so we wanted to make, um, make our ordinance um, in conformance, that it is um, in compliant with that act. The second chapter, the general provisions. Um, we tried to make this a little bit more user-friendly um, we are updating um, with new graphics. We are being more specific about things. For instance, um, you know, we are showing where accessory uses and buildings can be allowed on lots. Um, we have added new provisions, um, which are, they will be new to this ordinance, such as um, donation boxes, where they can be located on commercial properties, storage containers, um, for instance, like a pod, how long where they can be um, placed, flagpoles, place escapes, which are exempt, and then um, even personal ice rinks. We've had requests for um, individuals to allow a personal ice rink in their backyard, which is great, um, but you know, sometimes there's other things that we need to look at. Um, another thing that we did is we provided a graphic, um, which we can talk about if you want later, um, is for RV parking. That always um, seems to be, um, you know, a little bit of an issue. Um, and with this graphic, we can clearly show where RVs are permitted to be parked within the city and that helps with our code enforcement as well. Um, and then also with fences, um, it can be tricky sometimes for um, uh, pro property owner to understand that, that on the quarter lot, they have two front yards and where they can put their fence. And this will hopefully clearly show them um, where they can have a fence and what, how, t how tall the fence can be. This is one I will point out a general provision which is um, which is will be new to our ordinance but I think is really valuable and this um, actually goes to the uh, vacant property on Lake Street. Basically this states that um, if you are infilling into an existing um, housing neighborhood that the new house has to match the character, the historic exterior design elements um, and be in harmony with the um, existing neighborhood. So for instance, I showed you this, um, this picture here, clearly this new build probably is, is allowed per their zoning ordinance, but does not fit the character of the neighborhood. And I think that, you know, we all want to make sure and protect the, the you know, the, um, the nature of our neighborhoods. Um, and specifically, uh, we're looking at, you know, the vacant lot and what will be developed there. It's important that it matches. Um, and it looks consistent and looks like it's, it's been there for a while. Okay, so the next section are the districts and I will just kind of give you an overview. Previously, um, you had a, um, you had each section written out and it had a list of the uses. So list kind of like in, um, you know, in table format, not in table format, I'm sorry, um, in a different format. But what we've done is we have listed all of the uses. We're gonna list all the uses within each section. And we are also going to put the bulk regulations, which I have here. So when you open a district, you will be able to see what is allowed in that district, whether it's a permitted use or a special use, and also all the setbacks and um, requirements that are permitted. Um, previously, you had to go to an entirely separate section of the ordinance. We feel that keeping this all together, much um, easier to utilize and um, um, keeps things clear. Um, so one thing I will note is that um, we have removed the IRO and we had it um, as a district industrial research office. We do not have any land or property zoned within the city for this. Um, and really this can be accomplished um, if we want to have a, um, a, a development that is mixed use or kind of crosses into industrial and office. Really that can be accomplished through PUD. And the last one that we removed there is a vehicle, vehicular parking district. And that actually, there's one parcel in the city and that parcel actually, I believe is the uh, tube mill 
they have a, um, a lot that is completely parking. Um, we will remove this um, so that we don't have any additional just parking lots. Municipal parking lots are separate, but parking should be attached to, to a, a business. Here's an example of our residential, like I said. Here's the table, I break it down and show each of the districts, whether it is permitted, whether it is a special land use. And then if there are references, for instance, um, home occupations, they need to go to section 102.23 to look for any additional information. Um, we also removed what we called cumulative districts. In our current ordinance, you start out with, um, for instance, RT. RT lists all the uses that are there. Then you go to RM1. RM1 says you can do all the uses listed in RT and then these list uses. And then RM2 says you can do all of it. So it, it's kind of cumulative and it's a pyramid effect. It's just a lot easier to see this all in one um, place instead of having to flip through you know, the ordinance to go back and forth. Um, so for business districts, one of the things I want to um, point out was that um, we proposed to eliminate um, the community business district. Um, there are two, two sections of the city that have community bus business districts. Really, they function to operate as a general business district. The setbacks are virtually the same. Um, and so instead of having that separate district combine them into one. There really is no differentiation between the two. And then um, proposing to expand the central business district. And I will show you on the map, and this is something we can talk about later, but I just wanted to show you. Proposing to expand, um, currently B2 right here is the, is the um, central business district. It's actually quite small, and it really doesn't represent all of our downtown. So that's the central business district. What I would like to do is expand the district north up until Abel here, and, and also south from Liberty down to Reynolds Suite. Um, and you see that over here, this is the future land use map. Future land use map recommends that all of these here in blue be central business district. And that's what we would be doing. We would be rezoning the properties in conformance with the master plan. And it's much more logical. A lot of you know development that occurs here, people think they're in the central business district, but technically that they're not. Um, and so this will give them the benefits um, allowed in the central business district um, that they would not have um, you know, in B3. Like for instance, rear yard setbacks are required in B3 in the central business district, they are not. Also within the business district, um, we are going to, we have provided, um, sorry, Architecture and design guidelines are referenced in the business district, which give um, every the developers an idea of how things um, can um, be developed or be designed. Um, so we've got some graphics here, and also there from our master plan, there is a PUD overlay on the entire downtown business district, which allows um, you know the developers to come in and to get a little bit more creative. Um, and do some of the buildings that um, we have shown in the master plan, such as buildings with zero lot line, um, mixed use buildings, and this will allow that to occur. Planned unit development is basically um, the same. It's just its own chapter now. Um, we outline the procedures and submittal requirements. A new, a new article that we have, which actually um, it's called, con I have it here listed as conditional land uses. However, um, per the city attorney, um, she's recommended that we, um, we change that name. And so it will be changed um, to something different, more like um, standards uh, for specific uses. This is very similar, I know. So, um, it's very similar to a special land use in that we do wanna, there are criteria and additional things we wanna look at these uses may have some impact on the neighboring communities, but not, not, so, not so great that we feel that there needs to be a public hearing. Um, so with the conditional land use, uh, we have standards that are written. So for instance, it will say, you know, I've got listed example down here, a microbrewery or brew pub. There will be a list of conditions under that. If all of those conditions and standards are met, then it is considered a permitted use. It does not have to have a public hearing. It's not a special land use. They meet those conditions, um, it is. And so we were able to remove some um, um, uses from the special land use, which really, you know, they have a little impact, but not really that great of an impact. We were able to move into this chapter. Special land use basically um, is, is essentially the same. Uh, we did highlight what the general land use standards are, 
they were kind of um, mixed around within our ordinance and really um, not clearly defined. Now in the special land use um, section, it will clearly define what the general standards are. And then for each particular use, you will see that there are additional standards uh, for some of the uses. Uh, site plan review, um, we presented a table that um, basically itemizes what requires site plan of review. Um, for instance, uh, new construction and development of any non-residential obviously requires site plan review. We added something called a sketch plan, and this was really for minor expansions like parking lots or landscaping. And what the sketch plan does, it's not a full blown site plan, and the sketch plan is something that can be um, approved administratively. For instance, if someone is doing some landscaping change, um, if they're expanding their parking lot by, you know, under a certain percentage, or they're, you know, bumping out um, their building less than 100 sorry, less than a thousand square feet, and really there's no impact, um, you know, to the site or anything else. Those things can be done administratively. We do have um, written in there that th things can be taken to planning commission if possible. We've also clearly written out the application and the requirements. Like I said previously, they were kind of thrown all over the, um, the uh, zoning ordinance and was difficult to find. I, I see a hand, do I wanna? Yeah, that's perfectly fine, Ms. Magnar. Councilmember Kittle, go ahead. Yes. You're yeah. muted, Councilmember Kittle. Right. I have him muted. You no, had no, made. No, he's. Well, he's okay. Good. Yeah, you had yes. made a reference to the um, this site plan review being able to go to the planning commission. So is that upon their request? Is um, what is the what are the criterion for that? Um. Thank you. I should be clear. Um, something that is eligible that can be done as a sketch plan where in our ordinance it says you, the administrator can review it. If the administrator feels that it's um, that they're not sure or they really feel that the planning commission um, needs to review this, then they can, they reserve the right to take it to the planning commission. Okay, but the, the, as the is, client does? No, the, the city, the administrator reserves right. This, actually, the client could too. They could go to the planning commission. Okay. Anything that's new, any new construction essentially is going to go to the planning commission. Um, any special land use and any you know residential development, those will all go to the planning commission no matter what. Sketch mm -hmm. plan is really, like I said, for you know something small. They're you know they're rearranging their parking lot. I was really most, doesn't need to go. I was mostly ahead, interested in finding out whether or not they had the option to make sure that the, the whole commission had the ability to weigh in on it. So okay. on the sketch plan thing. thing. Okay. That's all I had, thanks. Okay, very good, sure. Ms. McIntyre, just one moment if I may. Yeah. Um, City Attorney Hamame, I see that you are here. Um, if I may just uh, ask a quick question on, um, do all of those here that are doing the meeting remotely need to state the city that they're t partaking the, the meeting in? Yes. Okay, great. So let me, let me apologize. I had it in my calendar for 7.30. I'm so sorry about that. Non-issue. Non um, but now uh, we've gotten everybody except uh, Commissioner Kopkowski. If yeah. you wouldn't mind uh, just taking a moment off mute and just announcing where you're at for the virtual meeting and then we should be caught up. Virtual meeting, South Lion. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Right. Um, Ms. McIntyre, feel free to take the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a new um, chapter. Again, this, um, these things were kind of um, strewn throughout our existing ordinance, but now they are put together in one um, chapter. Um, so how to rezone a property, uh, zoning ordinance and um, text amendments, or master plan amendments. And then we've also added the conditional land use. We did not have any reference in our zoning ordinance to a conditional land use. Conditional land uses are allowed per the state statute. However, we would like to have that in our ordinance, our zoning ordinance with specific guidelines. So we talk about the process um, and how long it is effective. So those standards have now been um, laid out within our zoning ordinance. Um, Nonconformities uh, section, we really, only thing we really changed was that Previously, we had something called a Class A and a Class B designation that the Planning Commission would designate them. Really, that is kind of um, old-fashioned and really doesn't have any bearing. If they're non-conforming, they're non-conforming. Um, and so we have provisions written in here that allow for the continuance of non-conforming uses 
um, of structures and or land um, with some caveats. Um, but then we also have, you know, in here we also talk about, for instance, if um, a non-conforming use is damaged um, or destroyed more than 50% or of the value or greater, then that no longer can exist. Um, it will no longer be a non-conforming use and it has to come into conformity. We've also listed what um, the termination of abandonment of a non-conforming use is. So if someone walks away from a property, it's derelict, it's not conforming, um, there are criteria that the city can uh, review and determine um, that it is the intent of the property owner to abandon it and then it will then have to be redeveloped in conformity. Um, parking lot and loading, um, we just updated the um, current uh, standards from the Institute of Transportation Engineers. We use their standards. Um, and so, for instance, you know, if, um, so like how many um, spaces per, uh, hun, you know, gross square foot of a commercial business. So those are all listed out specifically. Um, previously, we had some, they were not very specific, um, and we had to do a lot of interpretation. Um, we've also provided a standard um, that allows, that talks about the maximum limit for parking. I know that sounds strange, but sometimes particular uses need additional parking, but we also want to make sure that they don't, um, you know, go too far. We, we don't want a lot of impervious surface. Um, we have itemized provisions for shared parking, parking lot deferment, and accessible parking. We've also provided some additional um, graphics, which hopefully will help thing, um, make things a little bit um, easier and easier to see, clear, and understand. We have a new chapter, which is access management. Um, really, this talks about um, you know the distance between um, driveways. A lot of the city is built out, so this really pertains to um, if there's new construction, how far, you know, part of the driveway should be. Um, but anytime we're retrofitting, we would pretend, we would like to maybe be able to use a rear service drive or an access drive, you know, behind the street so that they can be connected. Eliminating, you know, as many conflicts, um, turning conflicts and, um, you know, um, on the roads as possible. And so we've added a chapter for, for with those. The landscaping and tree preservation. Landscaping and tree preservation um, is pretty much the same. You had a really good tree preservation ordinance um, and that really, that has been included. What was not really clear were the landscaping uh, requirements. And so there are very, now very specific landscaping requirements for um, buffers along, um, you know, the street, uh, for parking lot, for instance, it's, you know, one tree per X number of spaces or um, gross square feet of a parking lot that have to be um, provided. And then also mm -hmm. buffer and greenbelt standards, buffers between, um, you know, uh, uses. So a buffer between a residential and commercial use. How big of a buffer does it have to be and what are the required plantings for that? So that is laid out very specifically. Lighting's a new article. Again, um, we basically that all light fixtures have to be fully shielded and da pointed downwards. We have foot candle measurement, which basically means lighting can't exceed a certain uh, foot candle at property lines. Um, this is new to our ordinance. We also include um, provisions that basically like prohibit architectural lighting. So you can't have someone um, put um, twinkle lights around the exterior of their building, highlighting their building. So those things um, are, are not permitted and we have provisions for that. Um, this, the administration, uh, very much similar. It's kind of standard in all zoning ordinances. Um, it uh, establishes the authority of the zoning uh, administrator. In this ordinance, we do state the provisions um, and the requirements for public hearings. There's also a provision in there for the requirement of a performance guarantee. That was, it was buried within our previous ordinance, but I think it needs to be stated clearly here. So that way, um, that way, you know, for construction, future projects that the city can ask for a performance guarantee to, to um, make sure that the um, improvements that are, that are proposed will be actually done. <coughs> And also certificate of zoning compliance, which basically just approves the use, um, and it's, it, it doesn't require a building permit. For instance, a, a fence doesn't necessarily require, um, you know, a building permit, but it's called a certificate of zoning compliance. They we go out and make sure it's where it's supposed to be. 
Um, after 24 Zoning Board of Appeals, we updated the membership. Um, recently, we um, decreased the membership from seven board members to five. Um, so we did that. We also added very specific standards for dimensional variance and use variance. They were not specifically written out clearly in our previous ordinance. That is um, important that those be um, written out. These are the state standards, but again, itemized so it is clear um, for the user. And finally, the last section are definitions. Um, and with those, um, there's new definitions that we've added. We've also um, eliminated some out of date definitions and we, have pro we are providing, they may not be in this current issue, but new graphics. Um, that is all I have um, as far as presentation. Um, so at this point, what I thought we would do is we could go, oh, oh sorry. Yes, Mr. Oh, yep. sorry, go ahead. Um, so if Ms. McIntyre, if we're done with the uh, presentation, and I don't want to finish yes. your sentence for you, but is now, is now okay for us to start going into questions from the commissioners and council members? Yes. Okay, great. Yes, yes. I, I will okay, help you good. try and navigate this. It can be a little bit of a chore. Okay. Uh, Council um, Member Kennedy, I'm going to let you go ahead and go first. Okay. So, Kelly, just uh, three things that uh, I picked up in the presentation you had there. You talked about non-conforming uh, uh, structure, repair or replacement. If it's less than 50%, uh, you're allowed to repair it. So that means that if you have a, a fence, for instance, that's non-conforming, it doesn't meet the uh, six foot height requirement because it's been there forever and you have some busted boards on it, you can replace those boards back the way they were, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, the other thing you mentioned something about is zoning for the parking lot and you referenced that parking lot that's across from MST. So if we do away with that zoning, what is that property gonna be potentially rezoned as? Um, that is a good question. Um, what I would like to do is, um, I, I mean, here's, I here's the reason for that question. Ahead, we just finished talking about Holly Hills. I would, if, if MST wants to expand the manufacturing operation, I'd rather see it go out the back of that property as opposed to coming across McMunn and having them put something there next to McCaddy Park. Agreed. Um, I believe that the adjacent properties are residential, so it would go to a residential zoning district. So what that means is in the future, if they no longer need that parking lot, what we would like to see on that property is more residential units, which is what is surrounding it. Um, it would be an existing non-conforming in the sense that it exists today, it's allowed today, but anything, if they want to do anything else with it, other than a parking lot, it needs to conform to residential zoning district. Okay. So it's allowed to continue as parking. Okay. Uh, and the other thing, just for my benefit on the terminology, you talk about the central business district. Uh, is that term interchangeable with the DDA or the two different things? Or can you describe the differences between the two? Yes, it is not interchangeable. Um, the DDA um, is uh, a district that includes um, Actually, I think Nate, they can kind of elaborate on what the DDA is, but the Central Business District today does not include all of the DDA, and the district lines that we're proposing may not also be um, in conformance with the DDA. The DDA is, is a, a body where, you know, a separate body. Um, it can be commercial businesses. It can be a general business district. It does not have to be the same as the uh, Central Business District more than likely they overlap and are very similar, but they do not have to be the same. So I see that Nate's on here. I, I was just looking at it. You, yes. you referenced the three sections for the central business district there, and you showed the, uh, the two outlying circles, the one that takes you down to Reynolds Suite, the one that takes you to the, uh, the railroad track, and uh, one in the center. That circle that goes down to Reynolds Suite includes the, uh, like the bakery and uh, Third Monk and everything. And those are currently part of the DDA, I believe. Is that right, Nate, or is that not? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So, again, it's, it's not a one-for-one one match. There's a lot of overlap and mm -hmm. whatever else in there. Okay, thanks, Kelly. That's all I had. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Kennedy. Does anyone else have any questions for Ms. McIntyre? Chair Lanham, floor is yours. make sure i mute myself before i start the talk so just a couple that i had was um <clears throat> just wanted to make sure everybody understood that the like the sketch plan is like kelly said it's not new construction so it's not an expansion of the footprint but it may be if it's in one of the strip malls they may 
you know, take over an adjacent suite or something to that effect and not change their use. Is that how I'm reading that? Correct. Okay. Yes, you're right. And then the one thing we didn't talk about before, I know you had like the uh, twinkle lights and that type of thing um, mm -hmm. not being allowed, but when it comes to <coughs> like Christmas lights or something like that, would there be a special permit like we have for Heinen and the Christmas tree and that type of thing? Or how would you address that? Um, we allow um, decorative Christmas, you know, or, or seasonal lights. Um, those would be determined. And I believe that we have basically a standard timeline. So like 30 days after the holiday, they would need to be removed. Um, but the type of um, lighting we're talking about would be permanent. Um, right. Usually it's LED. It kind of glows. It's highlighted. Uh, yeah. So we have provisions that allow for, you know, seasonal decorations that they don't need a permit for that. Thank you. Council Member Kennedy, just one moment. Let's make sure that no one yep. else has a question first right. and I can come back to you. Did anyone else have anything? Council Member Kibble, go ahead. Unmute. <laughs> Thank you. In that same vein, um, landscape lights that are that would wash up on the building, are those allowed? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yes. Anyone else doesn't have anything immediately? I'm going to go back to Council Member Kennedy. Go ahead. So on that exterior lighting section where we talked about, we're now going to, uh, you know, we're going to we have ordinances to specify the lumens and, and so forth um, coming off the adjacent uh, property, and, and that is that going to avoid the situation that uh, the uh, the council was faced with between uh, Witch's Hat and the car wash with that sign that they put in. Yes and no. Yes, because we actually have gone out and measured and the foot candles on that property. The foot candles, what it emits, is actually in um, compliance. What is not in compliance is basically the kind of glow that comes off of that from the LED. Um, and there are standards written into that that we will make sure are there. So Hopefully, yes, it will address that. Um, we, it's sophisticated light measuring equipment that we will need to invest in in order to measure um, you know, the output from those LEDs. Um, so that, that sign is, is very unique in the sense that that sign can never be created again. It um, is larger than what we currently allow in our ordinance because it was given a special provision. So something like that and the location um, should never happen again within the city. Um, so, okay. yeah, hopefully we don't have that situation. Thank you. I have a question. Council Member Richards, go ahead. Uh, Kelly, maybe, I don't know if I'm reading <coughs> my map wrong or not, but it was my understanding that in the future master plan that we saw, oh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, that uh, this business district was going to extend down Liberty Street and Lake Street to Warren Street, okay? Uh, I may be reading this wrong, okay, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure, okay? Uh, where there are residential houses, but they can be converted into uh, front small front businesses like they have in Plymouth. Mm -hmm. uh, and expand the use there. Uh, clarify that, please. Um, okay, so I do not see the those uses expanding. Let me see. Sorry, I'm trying. I'm trying to look at my um, my master plan uh, future land use map. Yeah, I do see them coming down into um, you know on to ten mile for but not quite till looks like, what is the street? Sorry. Can't tell what the street is. It's it does not go to Warren. Was Washington, thank you. Yes, yes. So it shows that it goes to there, which it currently does. It, they wouldn't expand any further than we already have as far as east to west. Um, we're not proposing that they expand any further than they currently are as far as the um, commercial business district they would not expand east or west. It would really only be north and south and would be in conformance with what the future um, land use map is. But it does not go down, um, does not extend um, very far down and on 10 mile. I'm looking at it. 
Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. I probably, I, probably I could show you on a map. We could sit down and go over that a little bit um, more closely. I'd like to see a big, bigger map. Uh, maybe it's my visual lack of uh, uh, abilities, but I, uh, I, I, I would like to see a bigger map, really. No, and we can certainly do that. Um, yeah, th these are small and hard to read, and I'm happy to sit down with um, with you um, if you like at a future time, and we can um, look at those um, in closer detail, and we you can ask questions, and we can look at that. So, and see if anything needs to be changed. Well, let me ask another question here um, before we move on. Um, are we going to individually, all the councilmen and the uh, commissioners, have a chance to go over the articles, uh, the different comments on specific items in the articles, or uh, just leave it as such and save it for the next meeting or something? What's your, what are we going to do here? Okay. Yeah, that was my, that's what I wanted to get into next. Um, I propose that we uh, go article by article. For instance, I'll say article one. And then if anyone has any questions, concerns, on that article, we will address it and we will go through each article. Um, at this point, really, I'm only interested in content and substance. Um, I know that there are some numbering errors, there are some formatting and some grammatical things. Um, those, those are important and if, if the, you'd like to, um, you know, give me a copy of, what, of a markup that you have, that's great, we can do that. Um, but really, it's just content right now. Um, those um, grammatical and formatting things will be the last thing we do. Um, it's a better use of our time to kind of um, just go over the content and the substance. Um, and again, this zoning ordinance, when we adopt it, it we won't know if there's problems. Kind of, a zoning ordinance kind of is, is, a, is a little bit of a working document in the sense that we may come across a situation that we had never anticipated. And so there may be tweaks that we have to do along the way, revisions, um, you know, amendments to the zoning ordinance. Um, but all in all, what we're going to past um, and present present to you and hopefully approve, we do believe we'll capture all of the um, potential uh, possibilities. But again, it is a working document and, and it's not going to be perfect the first time. Um, we, we hope and wish it would be, but there's always a situation that you can never anticipate. Um, so we'll do that. So does going article by article sound sound good? Yes, yeah, certainly. Council Member Kubel, I saw that you had your hand up. If anyone else has any questions before we get started with that, Feel free and, and we'll go through that and then we can go through article by article. Councilmember Kibble, go ahead. Yeah. I was curious, the the expansion of the CBD, uh, one of the, the potential consequences of that is that it uh, alleviates some of the responsibility for on-site parking in the, the places that would end up uh, getting the designation. And I was wondering, have you guys forecasted what the solutions to account for that, I mean, will the city end up taking on the responsibility of fulfilling whatever parking might end up being necessary that will no longer be their responsibility? Or do you have something planned or are you just want, waiting until it really presents itself as a problem? A lot of the businesses that um, are currently, that currently exist are well, some of the businesses that currently exist are in the general business district and don't provide on street or don't provide um, on site parking that they rely on street parking. Um, there is a provision in our ordinance that says that if you if there is um, on street or municipal lot parking within 300 feet, then they can be exempt from providing on site parking. But if that's not the case, they still need to provide the on street or uh, um, on site parking. So if it's in the CBD, they might have to park, provide parking up to the rear. We wouldn't want that in front, but they could provide it to the rear. There's not going to be a lot of situations where that, um, you know, it takes place. And for the most part, really, it's going to be, um, you know, um, retrofitting. And if it's, you know, if, if a site becomes, is redeveloped, most of those lots, you know, are, are currently occupied um, with buildings. There's a few that aren't, but again, if there's on, on site, Sorry, if there is municipal parking lots within a certain distance, then then they're okay. They don't have to provide their own parking. That was my understanding. So we, hope and that I, that, we hope that that handles the situation. 
I, I remember reading some Sorry. aspect of that language where it could end up becoming their responsibility for, and I thought it was something, um, I don't know if it was for them to have to pay into something. You know, I don't, are, have you guys given any consideration to what Northville does where you, you pull money, if, you're, if you are in the CBD and you don't have land, uh, land to be able to afford for your own parking, close to there, you can buy into city, to the municipal parking, and there, there's some kind of a designation per car or one slot obligation or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, like a, a fee for each, uh, each spot that you're responsible for covering mm -hmm. because of what your load generation is. Have you thought about putting something like that together? No, we haven't. Um, so at this point, it's, you know, it's, there hasn't been a, a, a payment um, in lieu of on-street parking, but um, if that's something, we, we could certainly explore um, that if that's um, the general consensus, we can do that. My interest is in it's, us trying I to think get that in that's front of a, it. Probably a policy decision that I was just hoping we would be trying to forecast what we, what our solution for the next steps would be rather than waiting until we're kind of thrown into it. Um, so I was just hoping we could flesh out some ideas about how we can solve the problem before it arises and becomes problematic. So, okay. thank you. I got, I got a question. Okay, Councilman Richards, go ahead. Uh, Kelly, uh, how much, presuming that each one of us has a few bullet points that we want to enlighten us uh, on, um, how much time are each one of us going to be allowed to speak on these points uh, uh, per article as we go through them? Um, can, you, can you give me a time frame? Um, well, I, th I think that if it's something that the council as a whole has a you know, has a concern about, we will talk about it, um, you know, as, as much as we need to. But I, I'm, I'm thinking that a majority um, of the questions are really gonna be clarification of me um, and or the Planning Commission just explaining what it, the intent is um, and not debating um, or kind of rewriting um, the uh, provisions. But uh, perhaps we can, I don't know, um, play it by ear and see what happens and if we feel like um, we're spending too much time on something. We can keep. We can move on. And if that's something that you you want to address with um, with me individually, and I can explain it or kind of hash through it with you, then we can do that. Okay, I, I will. Uh, I'll take that into account and just uh, make little points that uh, need through the articles that need some revision mm -hmm. or some examination. Let's put it that way. Okay. Now, one one point I wanted to make on this. On, we're still on Article Two here. During general provisions, I've read it and I've read everything else. There is no mention anywhere in here about a policy for garage sales, unless it's considered as a part of special events as listed on page 233. Uh, can you comment on that? That also is a policy decision. I, I believe that, you know, the city I don't want to speak for the city, but my understanding is that the city does not want to have a role in in handling garage sales. Um, a garage sale t usually is, you know, a couple days. Um, some communities require permits for that. This, our city doesn't. We're pretty, um, you know, pretty amenable to that. Um, oh, Judy's saying maybe yep. we do. We do. We do require permits. It's five dollars, and it's for. Th oh, okay. Okay. So very good. So yes. Um, so, thank you. So so that limits that. Usually something like a garage sale that is um, addressed in the code of ordinances and not necessarily the zoning ordinance. So that wouldn't be addressed in this. Um, okay. All right. Then we're in the wrong, I'm in the wrong ball game for, for that particular point then. Okay. No, not, I understand. Not necessarily. But I, not necessarily, but yeah. I hey, thought it was important to, to mention. Thank you. No, it, it, thank you. Are we 
Yep, I think if every, no one else has anything immediately, I think we go ahead and go through each, um, each chapter here. Okay. Um, article one, are there any okay. questions, concerns? This is the title, purpose, and authority. This really sets the stage for the ordinance itself. City Attorney Hamame, you are muted. <laughs> Uh, Kelly and I had a pretty significant conversation this afternoon about some of my suggested changes. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate or what you think, Kelly, about highlighting just the highlights so everyone's on the same page as far as what we're going to do as far as some changes. Um, okay, we can, we, we can. Just, just the big things. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Go ahead. So the first uh, the first thing is, actually, this is chapter two, so I'll wait. Okay, yeah, okay. I was like, I don't have anything marked on this particular chapter. So, any questions with article one? Looks like no. Okay, article two, general provisions. Accessory buildings and structures. Anyone? The attorney Amami, go ahead. So just two things that Kelly and I talked about uh, changing. It's um, page 2-7, which is section 102-14. We talked about uh, determination of similar uses. Uh, paragraph B says that if a, a, an applicant is aggrieved by an interpretation by the zoning administrator, they can petition for an amendment we talked about adding or apply to the ZBA. So that was just another option we were gonna put in there so it can go to the ZBA. And the other change that we talked about in article two was when we talk about temporary building structures, section 102-46, um, where in paragraph A2, where it talks about moving storage pods being allowed as long as there is an active building permit. Um, Kelly and I had a conversation about, well, what does active building permit mean? You can get a building permit for a year. So if I apply for a building permit, put this pot in my driveway, it lasts a year. Can I then apply for another one? And having done no construction, and ultimately this could evolve into a multi-year issue. So we're gonna revisit that a little bit. So you'll see it a little bit different. Um, when it comes back to the planning commission. And that's all I had for article two. Council member Kennedy, and then I'll come over to you, council member Kibble. So Kelly, when we talk about temporary structures and, and so forth, um, and maybe this, it belongs somewhere else. I don't know if it belongs in here. What about those temporary carports that people put up and they're all in the uh, press, the, uh, the front uh, plane of the house and so forth in their driveways. Yes. Can you do anything as okay. far as addressing that, or is this the section four, or is there a different? Um, no, you are you are correct. I'm trying to find it. This is this is the right section to address it. Um, so, actually, um, city manager and I had a discussion on this because um, what is permitted, um, we've written in, we're allowing car canopies at this point. However, they must be behind the front plane of the house. Um, they have to be in the side or rear yard um, and they have to be three feet from a side or rear yard and they have to be a minimum, they have to be 10 feet from the structure. Um, but when you actually kind of um, do the math on that, that makes it virtually impossible in order to have one. So that's something we need to look at. Um, the provision of, of um, Accessory uses, we always say that the accessory use or building has to be a minimum of 10 feet from um, the main structure. And perhaps that's something that is not required of a, um, you know, a car canopy um, or, um, you know, the, a cover like that. But again, as it's written, it has to be three feet from a lot line, must be behind the front plane of the house. Okay, well, I mean, if you've got an attached garage, uh, they can't put it out in front of that attached garage. Correct. Yes, you're correct. Council okay, Member. I've got another one I'd like to bring up. One moment, Council Member Richards. Council Member okay. Kittle, go ahead. 
on, uh, on page 218, um, let's see, it's 102-30B2. Uh, it's building materials. It says, for existing buildings, material placement should closely match the character of the existing or original materials used on a structure. Now it's kind of curious, if you're doing a facade redo on a building, um, such as take the, the buildings in downtown, uh, Mr. Borgman's building, um, those are substantially different than what, what the originals had been. And I think that everybody would agree that thought that was really a step in the right direction. So is, is this just a general comment or is there some, something that I'm missing as to why, why we would really be trying to push to keep like materials from what their original was? That is a very good point. Um, I, I think the intent is that if you are um, replacing the materials or you're, you're um, renovating that it be similar to what you are proposing. But I, but I do, yes, I, I do see that there is value um, in allowing a different um, building material. Um, and I think that, you know, we can write um, something in here um, that, you know, certainly it can be, you know, looked at by the planning commission. I think that the one thing we wouldn't want, for instance, and I mean, I don't know is if you want an entire metal building next to, you know, all the brick buildings in the downtown. So whether it matches the character of the neighborhood. However, there could be a building that has some metal on it that is appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there's, um, you know, with, with some of this, there has, there is a little bit of um, discretion that is involved um, and the planning commission, um, you know, will look at that. But um, I think we could probably come up with language that's a little more clear that can address that. Um, I, I can make a note. I was thinking if, if, even if there were language that spoke to the notion that it's not written in stone, but right. that would be the preferred Prefer, right. tactic. Okay. You know, sure. yeah. yeah, no, very good. Thank you. Councilmember yeah, Richards. Uh, uh, Kelly, on page 215, uh, section 102-26, uh, where it talks about lots, at the very bottom of the page, it talks about lot splits. Mm -hmm. Article or sentence three says new lots may not be accessed by an easement. Correct. There are large lots in town where there was an old horse barn or something in back of a house up front, more or less, mm -hmm. and there was a driveway back to the old barn. Okay, uh, and if they split the property, uh, would this old uh, uh, of a little driveway be uh, usable without being called a second easement? Uh, or could it be a spin-off off of the original driveway? Uh, just curious how this is supposed to be interpreted. Um, so residential properties, you're allowed to have a driveway. So if it was a residence, then when you split it, you, you have a driveway that accesses that. Really, this pertains to commercial or industrial office, really um, non-residential uses. So you may not create a um, non-residential use that is accessed by an easement. Um, so that means that they must have direct access um, to a public road. Um, Okay, I, I, that's, I'm going to mark that here. Thank you. Okay, sure. Council Member Dill, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, I just have a couple of questions on 213 on home occupations. Yes. Sorry, sorry if I should already know these things, but I don't. No, it's okay. Uh, on, uh, no person other than members of the family residing in the dwelling should be engaged in the conduct of the home occupation. Um, does that mean, and I don't know this, that you can't Airbnb your house? Airbnb is not considered a home occupation. That's correct. Okay. So I just wanted to make sure. I correct. Yes. That. And then on E, there shall be no signs on any structure. What do you mean by signs? Are those like commercial signs or, or what kind of signs? Yes. Um, yeah. You can't have a sign um, in the on the front of your house or in your yard that says that you're operating, you, you do um, uh, upholstery in your basement or, or whatever you're doing, piano lessons. Um, yeah. So it needs to 
because it's in a residential neighborhood, it needs to maintain the residential character and feel. In fact, a home occupation, we shouldn't, um, someone driving by should not even be able to know that something is occurring in there other than it's a single family residential home. Okay. And the final thing is um, on G where it talks about the, um, you can't basically live on an accessible structure. Um, what about um, some like, there's some houses like on uh, Lake Street that have kind of like a mother-in-law house, uh, mm -hmm. you know, out back. Can people live in those or is that saying you cannot? Well, we're saying you can't conduct business. You can't, as far as a home occupation, you can't, um, you know, um, conduct that in a garage or accessory structure. So not, the home not business. I thought it was saying to not take place. Actually, she conducted entirely within the confines. I thought I thought this was saying you couldn't live in those. Not about not doing business. No, this is re this is restricted oh, um, solely to home occupation. Really about doing business. Home okay. occupation as as um, not literally occupying it, but a home occupation as an, a a job or profession. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. That's all. Thanks. I have one that's it's kind of a quirky one. Uh, 102 40 dash 40. It's on 227. Uh, it speaks to the idea that if you have, uh, if you're developing a lot or a, if you're doing a development that has 20 or, or more lots or dwelling units, that uh, you have a responsibility for some recreational obligations. And mm -hmm. then it makes lower than that it says the planning commission may modify the rec this recommendation when it's determined that alternative recreation facilities are provided in close proximity however and this is the part i'm curious about a contribution to the maintenance fund for those recreational facilities shall be made it makes no no mention of what that contribution unit price might end up being is that something that's in our uh, fee schedule it is not in our fee schedule and it would be commensurate to what it would cost to, you know, create um, um, a recreational area on that property. So it would be a one-time contribution and it, but it would be, I think that they'd have to, we'd have to have the applicant or developer provide us with um, an estimate of what it, you know, of plans, theoretical plans of what could be place there um, and what it would cost. We could um, certainly work with, um, I think we could work with some architectural engineers for, you know, or landscape architects for them to help us come up with, um, you know, a fee uh, total, but um, we don't have anything written as, as far as this is what the actual numerical number should be um, at this point. And what account would that, those funds go to then? Um, well, it just says um, for to maintain. So I think that that's a good question. I mean, we can we would we would need okay. to discuss that. Um, I think that really this pertains to the maintenance of like McCaddy Park. So who I think it's DPW. They maintain mm -hmm. the park, so the funds would go to um, to that. Um, but we would probably have to talk to the finance director a little bit more more closely mm -hmm. and get that tuned in. Okay. I, yeah. It just. It seems funny that the planning commission can modify the requirement and then you turn around and charge them what they would have had to pay had they provided it themselves. Um, right. Well, really that's that then the advantages. Be, well, they could get more houses. So instead of oh, providing that recreational area, they get more houses, but since they're within a certain number of feet to McCaddy Park, they don't need to do that. So their advantage is that they can build more houses so that, yeah, so. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else in article one? Or, I'm sorry, article, I apologize, article two. No? We're good to move on. Okay. You will notice that we jumped to Article 4 um, because we reserve, we've got a reserve section in there in case we ever um, need to add an article. Um, it's kind of um, standard to have reserved areas for additional articles. So the single family district, are there any questions or concerns? Councilmember Kibble. Uh, it, 
if you look at the, uh, the zoning classifications, or you have R4 with no clarification of what that actually means. Um, uh, this is on 4 dash 3. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. The bottom yes, of the you're page. right. There is no R4. <laughs> I don't know what that, yeah. Thank okay. you. I don't know. There is no R4. Thank you. The phantom zoning. All right. We, we can add it now. Thank you. <laughs> all right. That's all I had on that. Thanks. Councilmember Kennedy. Oh, wait, Kelly's done. Are you done? You ready, Kelly? Yes. Okay, on page uh, 4 8, we're in section 4, right? Article 4? Yes. Okay. Uh, we, uh, Four dash, uh, page 4 dash 8, we have up there impervious surfaces, including but not limited to, and then you have all the verbiage there. That doesn't read verbatim what was approved when the city council approved that on September 10th of 2018. Now, I brought that to your attention previously. Have you made that change? Yes. Okay, good. That's all I had. Thanks. Yes, I have it. Yes, I have it noted. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Article 5, Multiple Family District. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to keep moving unless somebody stops yep. me. Article Absolutely. 6 is, man is manufactured housing. Um, this really is the state's, these are the state requirements and standards um, that we have um, placed in here. The, they have a very, they're very strong. And so um, really there's no point in us recreating or, or trying to um, you know, revise those. We're just gonna use what the state has. We do have a manufactured housing dist um, um, district and one use at this time. Office, Article 7. We actually don't have any office, we have office on our zoning um, ordinance, but we actually don't have any office districts currently in our um, city, any pieces of land that are being used as office. They could be, they could be rezoned. As to cover it. Okay. Article eight, business districts. Okay. Article 10, industrial. Okay. Oh, sorry. Councilmember Kibble, go ahead. Uh, just a, this might be just clerical, but the page numbering being nine yes. for Article 10. Yes, thank okay. you. Yep, yep, we got it. Yep, thank you. Okay. Article 11, the, um, it says conditional land uses, but as I said earlier, um, speaking with the uh, city attorney, that they believe that can be confusing with the conditional rezoning. And the state is working um, on uh, kind of fine tuning some language. So that will instead be called site development standards for specific uses. It rolls <laughs> off the tongue. Exactly, so that, that's what I said. I said, how am I gonna note that in the chart? But yes. <laughs> Site development standards for specific uses. Um, and so all those uses are listed and then the criteria or the standards. And if they meet those standards that are listed under it, then it is a permitted use. And um, they clearly still need to go for a site plan approval, but they do not need to do anything further um, in order to um, be allowed to have the property used as such. Okay. PUD 12. Special land use is 13. Anything? 
Okay, um, Article 15, Site Plan Review. Oh, I'm sorry, Kennedy, go ahead. Uh, Hang on, uh, Councilman Richards, I'll come to you next. Do we need a page holder here, Kelly? There's no Article 14. Correct. Intentionally left. Intentionally left blank. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Richards, go ahead. Article 15, Site Plan Review, I completely understood with one exception. Okay. The part in there, the part in there says one year completion of a site plan. I'll point out, I would like to point out that many developed properties be there for commercial use or home use that the uh, contractor did not intend to live in or whatever. It took more than one year to complete. Some people, not, un not uncommon in this town, to go five years or ten years sometimes. Which, uh, which provision are you talking about? Out. Do you know which, which provision where um, it talks about a year? Are you talking about the validity? We do uh, have the validity of the site plan, which is one uh, year. Okay, the, 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 they have uh, one year to, to start the work, okay? And then yes. they can apply for an extension, okay? But, uh, Many times, okay, over the years, uh, that wasn't wasn't done, and, uh, and the, before the expiration date, they went in there with a bulldozer and, and knocked down some trees and uh, got red tagged. And uh, but then they got the project done. They went to court or whatever. Okay, I just don't like it. That's happened in the past. Yeah, what this does is this gives the applicant one year to start the project. So if they do not initiate, so after they get site plan review, if they do not initiate um, construction within a year, then they lose site plan approval. They can apply for a one year extension and they can let, you know, the planning commission know what are the circumstances? Why are you not um, developing? After that, then the site plan um, becomes expired. If they want to develop, they want to do something again, then they need to reapply and they need to show us a new site plan. Um, so it's not really about the length of time for them developing it, it's to start, um, to start the development. And we would consider that as pulling building permits. Um, so you could clear cut, and maybe we need to be more specific about this, but you could clear cut um, or you could prep a site. Um, but, and I think that prepping the site is considered a would require a building permit. Um, so as long as they are active, and I think that you, I think I know what you're talking about and you bring up a good point. And so we might have to kind of specify or get into more detail about what an active building permit is and what kind of progress should take place um, during that time frame. So I'm going to, I'm going to make a note to kind of think about that a little bit more and um, see if we can come up with something to further clarify. In the past, okay, uh, somebody would come in and uh, just knock down some trees in a small area or uh, um, put up a, a picnic area for their family to use or, or uh, a small ball field or a playground for their kids and call it development, okay? Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, and that isn't really what the, the plan might have been issued for, okay? Um, right. Just to make note of it, uh, this is not uncommon for that to happen. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. That's, that's a good point. Anything else to site plan review? Okay, Article 16 is the rezoning, um, how to um, for rezoning, master plan amendments, and then um, conditional rezoning is added. That's the new section um, that is added. Um, 102.215, conditional rezoning. Council Member Kibble, go ahead. 102.215, it's on page 16-6E, mm -hmm. the uh, reversion of zoning. Yes. It says, if a rezoning or conditional rezoning become void as outlined above, then the zoning classification of the property shall revert back to the previous zoning classification. 
the reversion process shall be initiated by the city council by requesting the planning commission proceed with consideration of rezoning of the land to its former zoning classification. The procedure for considering and making this reversionary zone rezoning shall be the same as applies to all other zoning requests. I'm just not tracking why if if you have a a situation where they haven't fulfilled what they were trying to accomplish within the timelines that were allotted them why we would end up having to go through all the additional hurdles to put it back to what the zoning had been prior to this project coming forward i mean historically it would end up being the, the clock would strike that they haven't fulfilled their deal clearly they're not pursuing this in a manner that's serious and that property would automatically mm -hmm. much much like the holly hills thing that have been mm -hmm. pushed into the residential and they didn't they didn't get their thing together in time it would end up going back to the uh industrial at that time so i'm just kind of wondering what all where all the extra hurdles came from right. to be able to get there i agree with you i don't think we need to i will confirm with the attorney there may be some legal issues as to why that has to happen i see the um, attorney um has her hand raised oh, good. city attorney okay. Mame, go ahead um i would imagine um that they put this language in here because we don't know how much time will lapse between the time approval is obtained and when it's reverted and master plans might change other uses might change you might not want it to revert back to the original zoning say 20 years down the line hmm. it seems as though if that were the case it would be incumbent on us to take a deliberate action to say that we wanted to retain the the new zoning class as opposed to um, having it have it having it not revert and where we try to just kind of slip one by everybody you know I don't think that 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 really is a um, it's working above board it, that's sort of like a sly thing where you just slip it under the rug and nobody's aware so it might end up going by and uh, it's just not good public policy I don't think Mm -hmm. Except that you have to go through the whole process of a rezoning with the public hearing notices and everything. To revert back? No. Oh, just, well. just to explain that I don't think it's slipping anything under the rug because you would have to go through the whole process of rezoning, including the notice and public hearing requirements. Well, if the, if the zoning doesn't revert back, then you're already there. So what... I mean, your your project might end up needing to be the pub, have public hearings to move forward, but the the rezoning part has already been concluded. If you just leave it dormant like that, well, I I think that that should end up going back to where it automatically would end up being. Either we make a deliberate decision, an overt decision, or that it would revert back to its previous status. I, That's just I, me. No, I, I hear you. I, I, um, I, actually, I agree. Um, I just w will need to talk further with the attorney as to whether that can happen without the, those procedures, without having to go through that those hurdles. Um, okay. But, but yes. Okay. Um, 17, chapter, Article 17, non-conforming uses, structures, and lots. Councilmember Kennedy. Steve, you have to unmute yourself. Councilmember Kennedy, you're muted. Thanks, you're Judy. Muted. Just, to, just to confirm, <laughs> Kelly, on 17-4 uh, up at the top of the page, number two. 
uh, we deleted that reference to Article 14 since there isn't an Article 14. Yes. Okay, thanks. Yes, thank you. Yep, we did. I have something on, on Article 17. Councilman Richards, go ahead. Uh, just to make note of it, uh, where it says on the front page here, non-conforming lots and structures are, and on it goes. Um, I just want to make a uh, mention that there are a lot of non-conforming lots and structures on lots throughout the city. And they usually are, are appealed and most of the time they're approved. However, in no cases should I think it be allowed or discounted that it's that uh, should the the changes or the approval of non-conforming devalue adjacent properties. I don't read that anywhere in here that uh, the the word would such such a uh, action would be if it devalued a property it would be prohibited. I don't see that anywhere here. Um, just letting you know, okay, uh, might be something to consider if you're going to if you're going to write something accurately. Ms. McIntyre, go ahead. What I would say is that it is already existing. It the use is already there. The structure is already there, so it shouldn't. It has no effect on the adjacent property because it exists today, exists tomorrow, it existed yesterday. What this um, is saying that it can continue. We, we won't, we don't want to and never want to create non-conforming situations. Um, so I don't believe that it would devalue the property um, because the situation is the same. It's status quo, it stays the same. Does that make sense? Well, then the, 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 what if the person that uh, owns the property decides to switch businesses from uh, a tree company to a landscaping company, okay? And he brings in uh, things that uh, is not non-conforming. I, I don't know, if it's a light industrial property, I suppose, not residential, uh, but he lives on the property. What, uh, is that gonna, is that impact allowed. the adjacent property? The, you're not allowed to expand the current the non-conforming use so let's say if it's within a certain area you're not allowed to add new buildings you're not allowed to expand where you keep trucks you're not allowed to do any of that you can't change the use if you change the use it has to be a permitted use so there shouldn't be any negative effects on adjacent properties you're not allowed to expand and you can't change to another non-conforming use you have to become legal Well, okay, I don't, uh, maybe that's very clearly stated, but I didn't uh, surmise it in my evaluation of this. I didn't, I didn't uh, codify it. Anyway, just bring it up. Okay. Um, thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Um, okay, chapter 18 is condo standards. Really this, um, these are quite simple and basically it says that you need to follow the um, site plan review standards uh, as if it were a commercial or other development. Most developers use condo um, process, the condominium process now instead of the subdivision act, which goes through the preliminary plat, the plat, the t you know, all those that can take years and years to happen. Almost, I, I haven't done one of those in probably 10 years. Everyone uses condominium development standards and this just lays out the process and says use the site plan approval process um, with but it does require that there be bylaws and a master deed um, and agreement so any questions on that okay what about article 19 off-street parking and loading councilmember kennedy go ahead and page 19-1 uh, residential parking and we talked about this previously kelly number two mm -hmm. Um, it says uh, no parking shall be permitted in required, required yards on a regular basis or lawns uh, or other unpaved areas residential. And we talked about the ambiguity of a regular basis versus the way the ordinance was written previously that uh, front yard parking in residential districts on other than a driveway shall be prohibited. 
Yes. It needs to be specifically yes. called out because we don't want somebody thank determining you. what regular means. Um, yes, thank you. You're correct. And um, um, the city manager also and I had a discussion about that to clarify that language. So yes, that will be revised. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Councilmember Kimmel, go ahead. I was curious, what, what was the determination um, to disallow it completely or to put a, a clock on what regular means? Um, not to permitted at all. Not permitted at all. You may not park on the grass. Hmm. Councilmember Dill, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I don't see it anywhere, but is there anything about um, regular parking across the uh, sidewalk? I, I know what you're getting at. I believe that that might be in the um, code of ordinances, the city code okay. for um, sidewalks and streets. Um, Mr. Okay, okay, maybe. So hang on, do we wanna go? We'll go to the city manager. Uh, yeah. Paul, go ahead. I was just gonna say that's within the Michigan vehicle code. It's not necessarily okay. within their ordinances. All right. Mr. Kennedy, does that take care of your point as well? Yeah, it's a, it's a ticketable offense. You can call the police, they will ticket the person. They'll okay. advise them to move and then they'll take it up. Yeah, they'll warn them, right. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. Kind of associated to that is the fact that we we end up generating plans for developments that are a given that people will be parking over the sidewalk. Um, we've got duplexes over by the park and that, you know, you can get one car that's on the driveway, the next car is going to end up being across the sidewalk. And they've gotten quite clever as far as, you know, their second car might end up being small enough where they'll go horizontal or parallel with the road in the apron mm -hmm. that leads up to the driveway. But, um, but nonetheless, when we allow setbacks that are so close that it's a given that they're going to, the second car will be across the driveway or the uh, sidewalk, then it's kind of, we create our own hazard. So, well, so is that a great solution are, to it? Don't get me wrong. No, right, no, um, residential units are re required to provide two parking spaces. So for instance, a garage space and one outside the garage. A lot of people don't use their garage for car parking and that and right. therein lies the problem. So they yeah. can be and be ticketed. Um, the garage yeah. space is for their vehicle. <laughs> so they must have two spaces on, on the property that they can park. Okay, well, I was, that's good to know. Actually, that wasn't something that I was aware of. Yes, yeah. Council Member Kennedy, you had something to add? I did, and, and the other thing we did to accommodate that is we did away with the prohibition of uh, not parking on the streets between November and April, so people can park that second car out there on the street now. So they've got available parking. Just depends on whether they want to walk from the other side of the street. Well, you're talking about that particular circumstance. I'm talking about the guy that's right there on uh, McCaddy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, access management, Article 20. Okay, what about um, Article 21, the landscape standards and tree replacement? Uh, I'd like to say something when the time comes. Councilman Richards, go ahead. Uh, basically, I agree with everything that's in here, but there's always some issues and problems that uh, aren't really addressed, okay? Uh, and it's not practical to assume that uh, that the, the, any individual is going to be able to replace trees greater than 30 inches in diameter with at a rate of 100% of the total DBH uh, diameter at breast height. Okay, uh, this is, uh, if they replace the trees if they're dead and dying, that's okay as long as they replace it in kind with uh, another, say an oak tree, you can't cut down 
uh, uh, three oak trees and replace them with weeping willows. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's impractical. Also, if a, if a person wants to cut the trees on his own lot, he owns a lot, he doesn't live on the lot, but he wants to start cutting the trees down, he wants to improve the property by cutting out a certain species of tree like the box elders and, and Chinese elm, uh, and then he, he, uh, uh, he grinds them up and, and uh, puts the, the shavings in a pile, uh, doesn't say anything about whether he could uh, uh, put, put it, you know, try, uh, plow it into the ground and improve his soil, because they will rot over a period of years and improves the soil uh, so for a person who wanted to do that. There's no mention of anything like that in here. And frequently, every so often, somebody with a lot that's covered with wood, they haven't developed it. We've got several on, one big one on Mill Street. Um, you know, uh, it's not, the whole thing isn't addressed. But basically, I agree with the, the, the bulk of the ordinance of what it's, the article, the article of what it says. Uh, just that there's some omissions in it. Thank you, that's all. Um, just to clarify that if if 25% of the trees that are six inches in caliper or larger on a site are removed, then they need to get um, they need to get a uh, tree removal permit. So if someone was going to be working on a, a wooded site, they need to get a tree removal permit. And you know what we would what the city would also ask is what are you developing? So I assume you're going to have a site plan to us, um, and those would go hand in hand. Um, so. No one should be just clear cutting a lot um, without a permit because those trees need to be replaced with a certain number of trees or a certain caliper. Um, that's just, I mean, that's, yeah. So we do have some provisions. Yeah. Um, 22, which is lighting. Any questions? Okay, what about Article 23, Administration and Enforcement? Okay, 24, Zoning Board of Appeals. Questions, concerns? I got a question. Councilman Richards, go ahead. Uh, just a uh, quick question over the whole matter. Uh, this is almost the last article. Why why is this included in the uh, planning commission at all? Uh, it should it would seem to me it should be a completely separate issue for a separate uh, uh, separate evaluation all across the board. It's the the, the people are different. Uh, the rules are different. The procedure for operation is all different. I uh, just wondered why does this included in our uh, presentation for the the planning commission? That's it. Because the zoning board of appeals is um, who the applicant or developer can go to if um, the planning commission um, says they no, or for instance, if someone comes to um, the city and the zoning administrator says no, you don't meet the setbacks, then they have. Um, an avenue of recourse. What what can they do? They can go to the Zoning Board of Appeals and ask for a variance of the standards. So the Zoning Board of Appeals is is very related, very much related to this, um, because they are looking at the standards that are all in this book here, and they are going to maybe allow an individual to not meet those or to relax those standards. Um, it's also in the state statute um, that you know the Zoning Board of Appeals their authority um, so it, it needs to be in here um, it, it it yeah it has to be in here but it, it lets individuals know um, recourse whether they can whether they um, want something um, appeals whether they want an interpretation you have to provide developers applicants with the option the next step um, if you know the answer is no, or if something is declined, or they have a problem, you have to provide that. Councilmember Kibble, go ahead. 
uh, if I could just expand on that, I mean, they're, they're also a detached uh, board from mm -hmm. planning. So, yes. you know, they're, they're looking at it with fresh eyes. So they're not already biased by the situation. Good point. Thank you. Councilmember Kennedy, go ahead. Well, let me ask, uh, let me explore that a little bit. Can somebody be on the planning commission and on the uh, zoning board of appeals? Sure. Yes, they can. Okay. Um, oh, it's not really Mr. very Moser. detached at that point. Well, um, well, what they do is they they are a liaison, so they're able to um, bring with them circum, you know, to discuss the circumstances or situations. In fact, the city council is permitted to have a representative on the ZBA. Currently, um, the city doesn't, um, but you know that that's one individual. Um, that one one individual, um, you know does get a vote but they are supposed to be they're supposed to be a liaison they can bring information um, but the planning commissioners should um, look at it um, as a zoning board of appeals member um, based on the criteria so they're really not just arbitrarily approving something but there's very specific criteria and if it meets those criteria then it, it is approved um, so while it might not have been approved during the planning commission because they don't meet the setbacks if the um, if all of the standards for the, for the um, dimensional variance are met, then it can be approved. So um, it, it's not necessarily arbitrary. There are specific things. So them being a liaison and them being on both boards um, shouldn't be a conflict of interest or... What about the, the other zoning board of appeals members? What kind of training have they had in uh, determining whether or not to grant an appeal? I mean, it, it just... You know, I've had the opportunity to uh, observe a couple of the meetings. It just seems uh, extremely subjective, just my opinion. I'm just curious what, mm -hmm. uh, what standards, uh, what objective criteria is applied as part of that process, or should there be, or is it just, if we, uh, we feel that that's okay, just go ahead and, and approve it? Not at all. Not at all. Um, there are criteria listed. They're even more specifically, uh, in our previous ordinance, they were kind of scattered around. We are very specifically listing all of these criteria. Um, the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, you know, there's training um, that is provided. We're off, we offer training. In fact, I know that some of our planning commissioners are going to be um, doing some training this week. Actually, all of them are doing um, participating in training this week. Um, Zoning Board of Appeals members as well um, that um, help them you know, understand their responsibilities and how they are supposed to review something. Um, it shouldn't be just because we think it's a good idea. It shouldn't be a personal opinion. It should meet the criteria. There should be what they call findings of fact. So for each of those criteria, they must state a fact that goes with it. Um, and based on if all those criteria are met and there are all those facts, then the variance can be approved. Um, is that, is that documented somewhere? Is that information provided to someone? And to whom does the uh, ZBA report? Who monitors them to assure that that process takes place? Uh, I don't know. Um, a city attorney the, circuit, from the circuit court. Okay. Yeah. So are they, do they document their decisions and is that provided to somebody? Absolutely. I mean, somebody absolutely, absolutely. Any sort of decision that's made by the Zoning Board of Appeals, they have to state the reasons behind why they're rezoning it. And the planner usually gives the reasons and what they are, what the findings are and how they can, whether it's you know dimensional variance or any, anything else use variance and what are what's prescribed and what's allowed and what's not allowed before okay. they make the, before is they that make decision, decision process is that result of that decision tree documented for review after that decision's made it's only reviewed if it's appealed you know if they make a decision it's not like city council or the city their administrator says you know no you can't do that they have a, they make it their decision making body just like planning commission is or just like city council Okay, but if you know somebody makes the decision that they approve something, and and all of a sudden you know the residents see this thing go up, and it's like, well, how the heck did that get approved? Where's the uh, where's the uh, document trail that says, well, this was the process they went through. They appealed to the ZBA, and this is the decision process the ZBA went through. They matched to this criteria, and this was the decision that was made, and this is the result of the vote that was made, whether or not to approve it. Where's that documentation? 
The that's minutes. all provided within the minutes. The minutes. Is, City is Attorney Amami. Okay. okay. Folks, let's get back on track here. City Attorney Hamami, you go ahead. I, I was going to say that it's all documented in the meeting minutes. Okay. If, if a matter, if a ZBA matter were appealed, then on the circuit court level, the only thing that can be considered is what's called the record on appeal. That would include all of Kelly's doc, the application that was submitted, Kelly's reviews, anything that was presented to the ZBA as part of the package, their discussion, their meeting minutes would all be part of the record that goes to the circuit court. Thank you. Council Mayor Kibble, just a moment. We've had several hands go up and I wanna make sure that their points have been made at least, or if they have not, we can get them involved. Uh, Chairperson Lanham, I saw your hand go up earlier. Did you still have something to add? Yeah, I wondered, I thought before with, uh, when you have the Planning Commission liaison, aren't there times that they have to abstain from voting as well? They have a party, yeah. They can. If they de decline, if they voted against a site plan review, for instance, it goes to ZBA, then don't they have to abstain on voting at that time? Yes. And not exactly related, but the training session we have, I've never received anything to sign into it yet for the third. Don't read anything into that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, What's that? You were breaking up, Kelly. <laughs> Go ahead, Kelly. I will follow up on that tomorrow to make sure you have the material. I, I will follow up on that tomorrow. Just a moment, Judy. Sorry. Uh, Commissioner Mosier, did you still have something you needed to add as well? Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, go on about the minutes. You know, the minutes are definitely kept and, you know, they are accessible. I see y'all. All right. Thank you very much. And, and Judy, go ahead. No, I just wanted to make sure you saw Steve. Okay. Yep. All right. So I believe we're caught up. Councilmember Kibble, did you still have something to add? I just wanted to ask um, Lisa Hamami, who has standing to be able to go to circuit court to appeal the appeal? An aggrieved party. Okay. And there's a lot be, of case law that defines what an aggrieved party is. Okay. Could that be, say, city council? Could that be, well. So technically it can be, and, and frankly, I've seen that happen, but you really don't want to do that. Well, I mean, that would be, yeah, pretty self-devastating. But um, <laughs> nonetheless, I could see where something might end up being egregious enough where you, especially if you, you saw a history of things that were moving in the wrong direction, that decisions being made didn't seem really to be based on good, solid evidence. Um, so I was just kind of curious at who, who had standing. So the agreed thing, <laughs> pretty broad base. So thank you. All right, I think we're caught up. Uh, Ms. McIntyre, the floor is yours. <laughs> okay, so we have gone through everything. Um, definition. I, I'd like to bring something up. Councilman Richards, just a moment. Um, City Attorney Hamame, did you want to summary or anything first before we go to general questions and comments here? You know, I'll reserve all of um, most of my comments uh, to work with Kelly and you'll see them at first reading. I do okay. want to raise one point, though, that might be worthy of discussion at this level before first reading, before the amendment is, is corrected and it's presented in first reading. And that comes down to, um, it's, it's really twofold. We cannot distinguish between place of worship and any other public assembly or place of assembly. So we need to treat churches the same way we treat theaters. So that's one change that we're gonna make throughout the document to make sure that we are being consistent in that application. That said, in the industrial districts, Kelly and I talked about, um, you are not allowing any place of worship or a place of assembly. And if that's something that you wanna talk about, this is probably the time so that we can make that change before it goes to first reading. If you're indifferent, then we leave it alone. Could you explain that a little bit more succinctly? I didn't catch where, 
where it lies. So your zoning ordinance divides everything up into districts. What can be, what activity, what use can be in each particular district? In your industrial districts, both I-1 and I-2, a place of worship and a place of assembly is not allowed in those districts. Oh. Hmm. Um, what Kelly and I talked about is that we do allow for like government offices or other government uses. And what we see in litigation sometimes is a place of assembly or place of worship will challenge an ordinance because something similar is allowed, but their use is not. I don't know that we have anything that's very similar. And Kelly and I talked about maybe removing some of the government uses from the industrial just to eliminate that argument. But if anybody has a strong feeling of whether that use should be included in the industrial district, um, that's just something I thought, you know, if you have a strong feeling one way or another, then it's probably a good time to bring it up so we can make that change before it's brought back to you. Councilmember Kennedy, go ahead. You know, I've seen that happen in uh, in Ann Arbor where they have warehouses that they've uh, sectioned off and all of a sudden it's a church on a Sunday kind of thing. And, um, but, you know, I don't know that we have that, but, uh, you know, it, it, I don't I don't know that we need to allow for it. If we need to take the government part out so we don't have the conflict, I don't see that that's a real major issue either. Let's make it totally neutral. Chairperson Lanham, go ahead. I don't think it's the case anymore, but, uh, you know, for quite some time there, there was a church up on Mill Street in one of the industrial buildings. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I know they're not there any longer, but that's all. Councilmember Kibble, go ahead. I, I was curious in that same light, I don't think that they, that we lose tax revenue as a product if they're using um, a property that actually earns money then we don't end up losing the revenue from the tax from that, which, you know, I mean, I don't want to put all of our eggs in that basket, but nonetheless, I think that it's something pertinent to us. You know, if you end up losing a large tract of land, like when you put a high school in or something, suddenly we're not earning that revenue that would have been generated by, if that was a subdivision, so. Did you turn your mommy, go ahead. Yes, except that some of these uses, some of the assembly uses, could also be commercial uses. Yeah. Councilmember, something. Uh, yeah, Councilmember Richards, go ahead. I know you, I didn't think your question was with that topic, so. Oh, no, it isn't. Okay. I wanted to go back to Article 23. Go ahead. I'll, I'll come back later. No, no, that's perfectly fine. Now is the time for general questions. You go ahead. Okay, uh, and I would uh, have on this article, uh, I missed it. Uh, I would like to hear Commissioner Lanham's thoughts on this uh, at the after I have said what I'm going to say, where it talks about administration and enforcement, okay? Uh, the zoning administrator, quote unquote, uh, economic director, okay? In the past, first of all, we've never had any such person that had the authority to do anything, okay? Second of all, over the years, and I'm going back 30 years, police department, different mayors and city managers have all gotten into the act over the years with trying to uh, enforce uh, zoning uh, board or uh, uh, planning commission rules. And the third item is uh, in the past, uh, de decrees by the Planning Commission of how to correct a situation have been a dismal failure and completely ignored. Examples of this would be the BP gas station for over a decade, the Knowles on certain points, and the former Bonner properties, just for an example. And I'd like to hear what Commissioner Lanham has to say about that. Chairperson Lanham, allow me to step in for a moment, please. Um, Councilmember Richards, this this is a workshop to put some time into working through a document for the city. Those questions appear to me to be um, very focused on some other things. Uh, city Attorney Amame, oh. if, if you would like to comment on it before I go to the Chairperson Lanham for his response. 
I, no, I didn't, I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry. Okay. No. And then, um, no, that's perfectly fine. I just didn't want us getting off the rails here. And then Chairperson Lanham, if you'd like to respond to any of that, or that to me seems like something that needs to be addressed um, outside of this meeting. I agree that there's been lack of enforcement in the past, but uh, yeah, it's definitely a, a, a council item probably more than anything else. Okay. Does anyone, uh, sorry, Council Member Richards, we're trying to stay focused on point here. Does anyone else have okay, any general, general questions over the topics that we've covered this evening for Ms. McIntyre, for the city attorney, or anyone else for that matter? Council Member Kennedy, go ahead. No, I just want to pass along my compliments. It's a, it's a pick and shovel job to go through all this and uh, you put a lot of work into it. It looks pretty good. I will, uh, I will second that. I know the two of you and, 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 and all of our friends at the Planning Commission, we appreciate your guys' hard work and effort on this and including just being here this evening uh, for, for certain things that you guys deal with on a weekly or biweekly basis that some of us just don't necessarily grasp. So thank you for being here. Um, with that, if no one else has any questions, I will look for a motion to adjourn this evening. Move to adjourn. Councilmember Dillon. Second. All, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Adjourn. Have a great night, all. Thank you Thank again you. for all of your efforts. Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks. Good session.